As I was driving for a long time yesterday, you know, the, the front of my car just got completely covered in, in bug guts from, you know, hours and hours of driving. And I thought a little bit about it because I was sitting there driving, you know, I'm like, well, is this a moral question here? Like these bugs, am I causing a great deal of harm here? Like, is this, how am I, like, should I be avoiding this? Or should, like, it's so, I find it so hard in our culture to not cause harm to other other beings so i got thinking well like are these bugs actually i mean you've talked a little bit about like what's conscious and what isn't like is a clam really conscious it's hard to tell or whatever insects you know they're probably conscious but i mean are they really iuocs or i got to thinking well you know that doesn't seem right like there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of growth and learning opportunities for some level of life i'm thinking well maybe it's just the LCS playing the these critters as like a kind of a background thing. And that got me thinking, well, Caleb, does that change the morality of these sorts of things? If it's really just kind of the LCS playing um, the creature as, a, as like sort of a background character versus kind of the frontline IOCs in whatever shape they may be taking, you know, humans or, or not. And uh, yeah. I don't know. Like, how do you, how do you handle or deal with that sort of thing? Like, okay. sure. That's a good question. And you know, there are some groups in India who, when they walk, they take a little broom and they constantly sweep the path in front of them. So as to sweep any insects or whatever out of the way. Now, I guess tumbling an insect over and over, head over tails with a broom, you know, is, is not as bad as stepping on one, but still, you know, that is a, because that is a uh, issue for them. And there are some people that are called uh, fruititarians that just eat fruit and they only eat fruit that falls off the tree because to pluck the fruit off the tree, it'd be an insult to the tree. So there are people that take this kind of thing very, very seriously. In my way of thinking, it's all part of this reality frame. The insects have adapted here to the fact that they have many hazards. They're by birds. They've splat on windshields. Uh, you know, if it if the winter is too cold, you know, that way may wipe out half of that species in a certain area because the winter was was too cold too long. Or sometimes you have an early spring. And a lot of bugs will get up and then they'll have a cold snap and stop, they all die. You know, all the ones that woke up now are all dead because the cold kills them. So the environment is, is such that the insects have adapted to that. That's why when they lay eggs, they don't just lay one egg. They lay 100,000 eggs. And these 100,000 eggs, not all of them hatch, but a lot of them do. And a lot of them maybe never even find food. It may be that 20% of the, you know, it's like ticks, you know, the little ticks you get out in the woods. Well, ticks lay tens of thousands of eggs. They create lots and lots of other ticks, but probably 80 or 90% of them all start to death because they don't happen to just be at the right place where an animal walks under a bush or where they happen to be and they can drop and get to eat. And if they get to eat, then that's part of their cycle, you know, that they can, they can then uh, perhaps lay eggs themselves or do something else. But that first lucky shot of being able to drop on something with blood in it is doesn't happen to but a small fraction. But then they create large numbers, such that they survive that way, you know, they're adapted to that. Well, in our environment, you should be caring of other living things okay that's that's true but how far do we take that well if it's another human or a dog or a cat well then we have to take that very seriously because now we have a iuoc something that you know has a life and that life is valued and you should value it as well but dogs and cats don't drop 10,000 puppies, you know, at a, at a time, you know, so it's a little, it's a little different than, than with the, with the bugs. Now with the bugs, each bug does not represent an IUOC. 
it represents perhaps something somewhat like an IUOC for maybe that whole species or maybe all the bugs in that area. But not just, it doesn't have enough, it doesn't make enough choices for an IUOC to be making the choices of a gnat or whatever those things were that you were running into. I know in Virginia, there was a thing called love bugs and they would get so thick sometimes that you'd actually run through a cloud of those. You'd have to stop, pull off the side of the road and go out and clean your windshield because you just couldn't see through them. They would be thick black clouds of these things flying around and uh, they would just completely make your windshield opaque. So yes, they don't have enough choices for an IUOC to spend its time making those choices, even a very diminutive IUOC. It's just not enough there. So you might say that there was an IUOC that represents the species or all those kinds of things in that, or maybe a whole bunch of different kinds of bugs in that neighborhood, or maybe they're NPCs and they're just run by the LCS, but it's not an IUOC like we are. It's not uh, making a lot of progress, evolving the quality of its consciousness. It's just kind of a player that does its thing. It's evolved to be here. After all, you know, the initial conditions and the rule set and all kinds of things evolved to be here, but they all don't make good avatars that a piece of consciousness would want to play. The only reason a piece of consciousness wants to play something is if it helps them evolve the quality of their consciousness. That's the reason for logging on. It's a, it's a choice making, you know, way of, of growing up more quickly, better choices, more profound choices. Well, the choices of a love bug or a lightning bug or something are not really big leaps forward in the evolution game. So I think that no, they, they in their own little way are doing the same thing we're doing in the sense they have choices. Let's say a lightning bug does have choices, whatever that limit it is. And if they make good choices, things work out better for them and if they make bad choices. So entropy still applies. Choices. So it, it still works like that, but they're not really making progress for themselves or the larger conscious system in any significant way but they are kind of work similar the way we do in that, in that case. But I think they have adapted to hazards, all sorts of hazards. And that's part of the way they are. Uh, you know, like the reason that fish have learned through evolution to swim in schools, small fish, big fish don't do it. Why do small fish swim in schools? Well, that's because when another fish comes along to eat them, They'll only get a few and the rest will escape. So that is their strategy. It says, all right, the big hungry fish comes along and it'll run into our school with its mouth open, but it won't get us all. So the attrition is part of their, part of what they do is they live with that attrition. So no, I don't think you have to be concerned about hurting the bugs on your windshield or the bugs that you might step on. I don't think you have to sweep them out of the way, but I think you have to be aware. So if you see an ant walking on a sidewalk, you wouldn't go out of your way to step on it. You'd walk around it. You'd step over it. You'd leave it alone. But if you were out, uh, you know, getting your exercise and jogging and running 10 miles, you probably wouldn't notice. You wouldn't be looking at the ground that carefully. Yeah. You know, you may not, uh, you just step on whatever happens to be under your feet when they land. If it's a bug there, then there's a bug there. And unfortunate for that bug, but it doesn't take a big negative. It doesn't increase entropy very much to step on that bug, if at all. Whereas if you, you know, you shoot your neighbor, that has a very negative effect on entropy. It creates a lot of dysfunction, creates a lot of problems creates a lot of chaos and, and uh, fear and other things that aren't good. So that raises entropy a whole lot. Squishing a bug on your windshield does not. 
raise the entropy of the system very much. So it isn't really something you have to worry about too much. Yes, uh, avoid it if you can, but if you can't, then you know you don't. Now in my house, I have a thing that uh, I let bugs be in my house, and as much as I don't mind living with some bugs, my wife has a whole different attitude toward that. You know, I see little spiders, you know, and they're running up the wall, and I say hello, and I just leave them alone. And they have webs in the corner, and I leave them alone until my wife notices them. And when she notices them, that's the end of them. You know, and it's not her that has to go get rid of them. It's me that has to go rid of them because she doesn't want to get that close to them. So it's a problem. It's creating a problem in my house. It's upsetting my wife. Then, uh, you know, how that goes. Your wife's upset, then everybody's not doing so well. So the spider. If it's easy to catch and put outside, I'll do that. But most spiders are hard to catch. They're fast. Uh, wasps and things, I can catch them. I put a cup over them, and I slide a paper under the cup, and I pick the whole thing up, and I let them go. But you can't do that with a spider because sp spiders are too fast to, to snatch like that. Besides, they get in little cracks and, and things that you can never get them. So, you know, they just uh, get sucked up in a vacuum cleaner or, you know, something else happens to them that's fatal and that's the end of them. So that's part of the risk of living in my house. If you're a spider, if you can stay out of sight, you're good to go. If you can just stay out of my wife's sight, you're good to go. So, you know, if you're in the garage or someplace where my wife never looks, you know, I got spiders in that garage have been there for years and she never goes and looks around in those places. So they live happily there and I don't mind them. They don't do anything to bother me, so I leave them alone. But if my wife went out there for some reason and saw those spiders, well, they would have to be removed. So sometimes I kill spiders and sometimes I leave them alone. Now things that multiply and then become a real big nuisance like cockroaches and ants, they get in my house, I get rid of them. Because I know what will happen if I don't get rid of them, I'm going to have hundreds of them. And if I don't get rid of those, it'll be an infestation that'll be almost impossible to get rid of. So when I see those ants wanting to put up a home in my house, well, they go right away, you know, they get stepped on, they get sucked up. I have no pity on those kinds of things, because I realize they are going to try to take over the whole house if they get a chance. So they already have a bad reputation. And because of their bad reputation of not being, uh, you know, the spiders don't do that. The spiders seem to only, to only uh, reproduce and spread around in as much as there's food for them. And there's not that much food for them in a house. They get little bugs now and then or whatever. So one or two spiders here and there can make a living. But you know, 100 spiders, most of them just die hunger in a house because the house just doesn't have that much things for them to eat. So the population stays small. So I'm fine with that. But roaches and ants and things that multiply and live inside of walls where you can't get them and I become a, a, <laughs> a, a killer of those things just because I, I uh, figure that that's you know, you leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone kind of a thing. You don't bother me in my life, I won't bother you in your life. But if you overrun my house, I'm going to do something about it, because I can't have them all through my cupboards and through my food and every place else, you know, that's not, that's not acceptable. So yes, think of it in terms of entry, if I kill these bugs, how much is that going to decrease or increase entropy? Well, it's not going to increase the entropy. It's going to, not going to raise it much either. It's not really going to make much difference. They have they are designed to deal with with those kinds of situations where you know half, two thirds, eighty percent, ninety percent of their population gets wiped out, and that's just normal. That's just part of what they're designed to do. Like the ticks, I think I read someplace that like ninety five percent of them all starve to death. They, they just don't happen to be at the right place at the right time. And uh, they don't survive. But 
they create so many small ticks that the 10% that does survive is plenty enough to carry on the species. So don't feel too guilty about running into bugs or even stepping on things that you don't know are there, but don't go out of your way to step on things. Or if uh, your wife doesn't mind spiders, then leave them alone. If you don't mind spiders, if you really don't like spiders and you see a spider and you want to get rid of it, well, then that spider has gotten into your space and it'll die for that mistake. It needs to go somewhere else. And that's really okay. It's funny because just today, actually, I was in my garage and uh, saw a spider about yay big made a, a web while we were gone, I guess, on the trip. And I was like, that also prompted me to think about that question. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> little bugs. Okay, now I've got a big spider here. Now, <laughs> what's my play here? <laughs> yeah, that's different. Now, let's say you have a big spider and that big spider is big enough to really hurt somebody. And let's say you have small children and they, your children play with stuff. They have toys in the garage. All right. Now, I would say you need to get rid of that spider. Now you can get rid of him by putting a stick or something up there and getting him and taking him outside, or you can get rid of him by sucking him up in a vacuum cleaner or splatting him someplace, but that's a, that's a risk. You have children, you have a spider big enough to actually hurt them, then the spider loses that, that argument and you get rid of it. Get rid of it by relocating it if you can, but again, what are you gonna do with a big spider? Pick it up and carry it you know, someplace? Probably not, you know, can you catch it in a can or a bottle? Maybe. Is it worth the trouble? Maybe. It kind of depends on how you feel about that. But if you can't, then it's to kill it. And the reason it dies is because it made its home in an inappropriate place. Now, you don't have children, like I don't have little children running around, so eh, big spiders don't bother me. Now, let's say you had a spider and you recognize it's a black widow and you have children around, kill it because it's a risk. The entropy that gets raised because your children get bitten by a poison spider is a whole lot more than the entropy gets raised because a spider dies. It's good that you are concerned. All those little bugs going splat and you're going, oh, you know, bugs, stay away from my windshield. But it's just the nature of things. When bears walk around in the woods, they step on ants and bugs too. And if they find a whole bunch of ants, they eat them. You know, they, uh, things kill other things that happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. You get eaten or you get splatted on a windshield or you get sucked up in a vacuum cleaner because you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's just part of existence. And if it's a, poison spider or a big spider and you have little kids, well, that's the wrong place. And it's unfortunate they ended up in the wrong place. But when you end up in the wrong place, often what happens is you cease to exist. Thank you. I and MBT events hope you like this video. We will continue to post videos for free on my YouTube channel. But please understand. These videos are expensive to produce. They represent many thousands of hours of production and editing, as well as all the necessary audiovisual equipment, computers, and software. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. It would be very much appreciated. The links are in the description below. Thank you.